Hello, word nerds. Welcome to this episode of the dictionary. It's the next one. It's not the previous one. I guess it's not the next one. It's actually this one. We're not in the past or the future. We're in the present. First word for this episode is analog. So you may think that we read this already, and we sort of did, but not really. Uh, we read analog with uh, A N A L O G. This is A N A L O G U E. Which we talked about a little bit in the previous episode,、uh, but for this one, it could also be spelled without the u e. This is the first form of two. This is a noun from 1826. One something that is analogous or similar to something else. Two, an organ or part similar in function to an organ or part of another animal or plant, but different in structure and origin. Three. Usually without the u e, a chemical compound that is structurally similar to another but differs slightly in composition, as in the replacement of one atom by an atom of a different element or in the presence of a particular functional group. Four, a food product made by combining a less expensive food, as soybeans or whitefish, with additives. To give the appearance and taste of a more expensive food, as beef or crab. All right, now we have the second form of analog. It is a chiefly British variation of the word analog without the u e. Now we have analogy. This is a noun from the 15th century. One inference that if two or more things agree with one another in some respects, they will probably agree in others. Two a. Resemblance in some particulars between things otherwise unlike. Synonym is similarity. To be comparison based on such a resemblance. Three, correspondence between the members of pairs or sets of linguistic forms that serves as a basis for the creation of another form. Four, correspondence in function between anatomical parts of different structure and origin. Compare to the word homology, and、uh, there is a synonym for all four definitions. It's the word likeness. I think that was pretty confusing, so it might have been pretty confusing to you.、Uh, but also, there are some words in the previous episode that might be more understood if you knew this word, analogy. So,、uh, for instance, I remember seeing、uh, maybe it was analogous. That brings up the word analogy a lot, so that might have been confusing. So maybe go back and listen to that one again. Maybe it'll help. Now we have a word that I thought was a different word, but it is the word analphabet. So it is the word alphabet with a n tacked on to the beginning. I don't think I've ever seen this before. This is a noun from 1881. A person who cannot read. Synonym is illiterate. Analphabetic is an adjective or a noun, and analphabetism is also a noun. This is from the Greek analphabetos, which means not knowing the alphabet, and of course that is from an plus alphabetos, which means alphabet. My grandma,、uh, when she was maybe in her forties, fifties, sixties, something like that,、uh, she actually tutored adults who couldn't read. I'm really curious to know if she's familiar with this word analphabet. Now we have anal retentive. This is、uh, two words that are hyphenated. This is an adjective from 1953, exhibiting or typifying personality traits as frugality and obstinacy, held to be psychological consequences of toilet training. Anal retentive is a noun. Anal retentiveness is also a noun. I would love to hear what they have to say about that in regards to toilet training.、Uh, in my mind, the word anal retentive has never really connected with anything regarding the toilet. I never really thought about it, but they—that's what they think. That's what psychologists think. So maybe there's some truth to it. I don't know. Now we have analysand, a n a l y s a n d. This is a noun from 1917. A person who is undergoing psychoanalysis. This is from combining the words analyze and the word and. It's actually a suffix and, as in the word multiplicand. 
I don't know what that is, uh, but we'll probably get to it in a little bit, uh, what that suffix means exactly. But this is analysand. Now we have analyze. It is spelled with an S, so it is the British variation of analyze with a Z. Now we have analysis. This is a noun from 1581. One, separation of a whole into its component parts. 2A, the identification or separation of ingredients to a substance. 2B, a statement of the constituents of a mixture. 3A, proof of a mathematical proposition by assuming the result and deducing a valid statement by a series of reversible steps. 3B1, a branch of mathematics concerned mainly with limits, continuity, and infinite series. 3B2, we have the synonym uh, calculus 1B. I wouldn't really call it a synonym in this case. It's just the 1B definition for calculus. 4A, an examination of a complex, its elements, and their relations. 4B, a statement of such an analysis. 5A, a method in philosophy of resolving complex expressions into simpler or more basic ones. 5B, clarification of an expression by an elucidation of its use in discourse. 6. The use of function words instead of inflectional forms as a characteristic device of a language. 7. This is the last one. We have the synonym psychoanalysis. Now we have analysis of variance. This is from 1918. Analysis of variation in an experimental outcome and especially of a statistical variance in order to determine the contributions of given factors or variables to the variance. And by the way, if you heard my uh, little informational thing on a few episodes ago about how I think this is good for kids, I still think that's true, but we do sometimes get words and definitions like analysis and analysis of variance, and uh, they probably go over many adults' heads, let alone kids' heads. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not useful. Now we have analysis situs. Two separate words. The second word is S-I-T-U-S. Could also be analysis situs or situs. There's a few variations. Anyway, this is a noun from uh, circa 1909. We have, uh, it just says, topology 2A1. So the 2A1 definition of topology. The uh, etymology says this is from New Latin. It literally means analysis of situation. We will do one more for this episode. It is the word analyst. A-N-A-L-Y-S-T. This is a noun from uh, 1656. One, a person who analyzes or who is skilled in analysis. Two, we have the synonym psychoanalyst. That will end this episode, but I need to pick a word, don't I? I'll get used to this eventually. I, I have to pick the word analphabet. That one threw me for a loop because I thought it was the word alphabet, but it's not. And it's just a person who can't read. So that will be it. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary. First word for this episode is analyte. A-N-A-L-Y-T-E. This is a noun from 1978. A chemical substance that is the subject of chemical analysts. No, analysis. My eyes were playing tricks on me. Next we have analytic or analytical. This is an adjective from 1601. One, of or relating to analysis or analytics, especially separating something into component parts or constituent elements. Two, being a proposition, as the line, no bachelor is married, whose truth is evident from the meaning of the words it contains. And it says, compared to the word synthetic. Three, skilled in or using analysis, especially in thinking or reasoning, as in a keenly analytic person. Four, characterized by analysis rather than inflection, 
as in analytic languages. Five, we just have the synonym psychoanalytic. Six, treated or treatable by or using the methods of algebra and calculus. 7a, uh, in italics, it says of a function of a real variable. So that's talking about the definition I'm about to read. Capable of being expanded in a Taylor's series in powers of x minus h in some neighborhood of the point h. I'm a little bit of a math nerd, but not enough of a math nerd to know what I just read. And that happens a lot. 7b, in italics again, it says of a function of a complex variable. The definition is differentiable at every point in some neighborhood of a given point. Analytically is an adverb, and analyticity is a noun. And boy, I had trouble with that word. Next, we have analytic geometry, two words. This is a noun from 1835. The study of geometric properties by means of algebraic operations upon symbols defined in terms of a coordinate system, called also coordinate geometry. Next is analytic philosophy. This is a noun from 1891. A philosophical movement that seeks the solution of philosophical problems in the analysis of propositions or sentences, called also philosophical analysis, and compare to ordinary language philosophy. Next we have analytics. This is a noun from circa 1590, the method of logical analysis. Next we have analyzation. It's a noun from 1742, and we just have the synonym analysis. Now we have analyze. It's a transitive verb from 1587. One, to study or determine the nature and relationship of the parts of by analysis. Two, to subject to scientific or grammatical analysis. Three, the synonym psychoanalyze. Analyzability is a noun. Analyzable is an adjective, and analyzer is a noun. We have some synonym information. Here we go. Analyze, dissect, break down, mean to divide a complex whole into its parts or elements. Analyze suggests separating or distinguishing the component parts of something as a substance, a process, a situation, so as to discover its true nature or inner relationships, as in, analyzed the collected data or data. Dissect suggests a searching analysis by laying bare parts or pieces for individual scrutiny, as in commentators dissected every word of the speech. Break down implies a reducing to simpler parts or divisions, as in break down the budget. Next is anamnesis. A-N-A-M N-E-S-I-S. -S. This is an odd word to me. This is a noun from circa 1593. One, a recalling to mind. Synonym is reminiscence. Two, a preliminary case history of a medical or psychiatric patient. The etymology says this is from the Greek uh, anaminisklthai. Whoa. A-N-A-M-I-M-N-E-S-K-E. S-T-H-A-I, anamimniskisthai. That means to remember. And there's more at the word mind, M-I-N-D. Now we have a similar word, and it will be the last for this episode. Anamnestic, A-N-A-M-N-E-S-T-I-C. This is an adjective from circa 1753. One of or relating to an anamnesis, or is it anamnesis? Yep. Two, of or relating to a secondary response to an immunogenic substance after serum antibodies can no longer be detected in the blood. That looks like that is the end of this episode. I'm supposed to pick a word that I uh, liked for whatever reason in this episode. And what shall I pick? There was a lot of uh, talk in this episode about analytics and analyzing and things like that, so I'm just going to go with the, uh, the base word analyze. Uh, I tend to be a pretty logical and analytical person in general, uh, so I guess that word sort of 
has a special place in my heart. So analyze is my word of the episode. And that is the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. Subscribe, share, like, follow things and stuff. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. We are on page 45. Let's get to the words. First is anamorphic, A-N-A-M-O-R-P-H-I-C. This is an adjective from circa 1925. Producing, relating to, or marked by intentional distortion as by unequal magnification along perpendicular axes of an image as in an anamorphic lens. I actually just watched a video that talked about anamorphic lenses uh, and what they do and how they got started and how to use them and such. Basically, the short story is that it's a special kind of lens. It has a very specific glass inside of it that squeezes the image so everything looks very weird uh, and vertical. And then when you want to watch it, Uh, Everything is stretched back out so you get a very, very wide image. That is all the detail I will go into. So it's basically a way to see uh, photos or or films uh, in a very wide, on a very wide screen. Again, very, very basic description. The etymology says uh, this is from New Latin anamorphosis, which means distorted optical image. Next we have anandamide. A-N-A-N-D-A-M-I-D-E. This is a noun from 1992. A derivative of arachidonic acid that occurs naturally in the brain and in some foods as chocolate and that binds to the same brain receptors as the cannabinoids as THC. And sometimes cannabinoids is pronounced cannabinoids. Uh, I'm not sure which is proper. Maybe both are proper. The etymology says this is from uh, the Sanskrit ananda, which means joy or bliss, uh, and then they've added amide, A-M-I-D-E, to the end. I don't know what uh, arachidonic means or arachidonic acid. Uh, I guess we'll get to that in a little while, uh, so I'm curious what that is. But there's been a lot of talk in recent years about uh, cannabinoids, uh, THC, CBD, all that sort of thing. Uh, so this is definitely something that's in uh, the, the culture, in American culture these days, something that we're talking about. So uh, I'm, maybe I'll hear more about anandamides. Next we have Ananias, capital A-N-A-N-I-A-S. This is a noun from the 14th century. It's a very old word. One, an early Christian struck dead for lying. Two, we have the synonym liar. So if I were familiar with uh, old Christian Jewish faith, uh, I probably would have heard this word, Ananias, but uh, I'm not, so I haven't heard it. But um, I guess if you want to call somebody a liar, you can call them an Ananias. Next, we have Anapest, A-N-A-P-E-S-T. This is a noun from circa 1678. A metrical foot consisting of two short syllables followed by one long syllable or of two unstressed syllables, followed by one stressed syllable, as unaware. So to be a little bit more specific in the example they gave us, unaware is two short syllables, un and a, followed by a long syllable, where. So it's just sort of lengthened out and it's, a, I guess, a long syllable. The etymology says this is from the Greek anapistos, which literally means struck back. And that is from pistos, which is the verbal of pain, which means to strike. Uh, And I missed anapestic. That is an adjective or a noun. Next, we have anaphase, A-N-A-P-H-A-S-E. This is a noun from 1887. The stage of mitosis and meiosis in which the chromosomes move toward the poles of the spindle. Anaphasic is an adjective. Next we have anaphore, A-N-A-P-H-O-R. This is a noun from 1975. A word or phrase with an anaphoric function. Next is anaphora, 
A-N-A-P-H-O-R-A. This is a noun from circa 1589. One, repetition of a word or expression at the beginning of successive phrases, clauses, sentences, or verses, especially for rhetorical or poetic effect. As in Lincoln's, quote, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground, end quote. Uh, that is an example of anaphora. And it says, compare to the word epistrophe, E-P-I-S-T-R-O-P-H-E. It's like apostrophe, but the beginning is a little bit different. Two, use of a grammatical substitute as a pronoun or a proverb or proverb, because there's a hyphen in between pro and verb, to refer to the denotation of a preceding word or group of words. Also, the relation between a grammatical substitute and its antecedent. And I'm assuming antecedent uh, in this case means opposite. Pretty sure that's right. The etymology says, uh, looks like this is from Greek, it means act of carrying back or reference. This is from anapherine, which means to carry back. Uh, and that's from pherine, which means to carry. And there's more at the word bear, B-E-A-R. Next, we have anaphoric, A-N-A-P-H-O-R-I-C. This is an adjective from 1904, of or relating to anaphora, as in an anaphoric usage, especially being a word or phrase that takes its reference from another word or phrase and especially from a preceding word or phrase, compared to cataphoric. Anaphorically is an adverb. Next, we have anaphrodisiac, A-N-A-P-H-R-O-D-I-S-I-A-C. This is an adjective from 1823, inhibiting or discouraging sexual desire. An aphrodisiac is also a noun. Uh, so I have heard the word aphrodisiac. So it's this word without the a-n, and that is the opposite of the definition I just read. Next we have anaphylactic. A-N-A-P-H-Y-L-A-C-T-I-C. This is an adjective from 1907 of relating to, affected by, or causing anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactically is an adverb, and anaphylactoid is an adjective. And if you didn't know what anaphylactic shock is, well, you are in luck because that is our next word, or two words. It's a noun from 1910, an often severe and sometimes fatal systemic reaction in a susceptible individual upon exposure to a specific antigen, as wasp venom or penicillin, after previous sensitization that is characterized especially by respiratory symptoms, fainting, itching, and hives. If I'm remembering correctly, especially with this definition, uh, if somebody is allergic to uh, say bees, uh, if they get stung, they might go into anaphylactic shock. They're basically, their body freaks out and shuts down, and um, it could possibly lead to them dying. So they want to go to the hospital right away. Hopefully they have an EpiPen, which they can inject themselves with that hopefully will, will make it all go away and make them better, but they should probably still go to the hospital. Uh, my grandma is very, very allergic to many nuts and seeds, and so over the years, we've had to be very careful with what, uh, what are in ingredients and things like that. Sesame seeds, I think, are the worst. Um, and I didn't realize this at the time, but there was at least one occasion where they were over at our house, and she started to have a reaction. She had her EpiPen. She stabbed herself with it, and I think everything was okay, but then they left right away, and uh, that was it. And she was fine. Next, we have anaphylaxis. I think this was also mentioned in, uh, in the definition for anaphylactic. Uh, this is a noun from 1907. One, hypersensitivity as to foreign proteins or drugs resulting from sensitization following prior contact with the causative agent. Uh, so that's a lot of big words so they can get the best definition possible, but uh, you know it's very similar to, uh, to what I said before about something... Uh, maybe that you're allergic to something getting into your body and making it freak out. Terrible definition. Theirs is better, but I sort of uh, brought it down to my level. 
And then number two, we just have the synonym anaphylactic shock. Next, we have anaplasia, A-N-A-P-L-A-S-I-A. -A -A. This is a noun from circa 1909. Reversion to cells to a more primitive or undifferentiated form. And anaplastic is an adjective. Next and last word for this episode is anaplasmosis. A-N-A-P-L-A-S-M-O-S-I-S. -S. This is a noun from 1920. A tick-borne disease of cattle and sheep caused by a bacterium and characterized especially by anemia and by jaundice. And the scientific name for the bacterium is anaplasma uh, marginal or marginali. Not sure of that. Uh, the etymology says this is New Latin from anaplasma, which is the genus name that I just said. Now is the time that I pick a word of the episode. What to pick, what to pick. Um, I may just go with our last one, anaplasmosis, just because it's a very fun word to say. Anaplasmosis. Uh, but I also very much like anamorphic because it is related to uh, filmmaking and photography, uh, and so I like that as well. But I'm going to stick with anaplasmosis. That's the end of the episode. Thank you for listening. I'm glad you got all the way through it. Go ahead and do the things and contact me and say hi. That's it. Goodbye. What's up, word nerds? Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Are you sick of me yet? Hope not. Because we are going to say some more words. All right, first for this episode is anarch. A-N-A-R-C-H. This is a noun from 1667. A leader or advocate of revolt or anarchy. Next we have anarchic. A-N-A-R-C-H-I-C. Could also be anarchical. This is an adjective from 1649. 1-A of relating to or advocating anarchy. 1-B, likely to bring about anarchy, as in anarchic violence or anarchical violence. 2. Lacking order, regularity, or definiteness, as in anarchic art forms. And anarchically is an adverb. All right, next is anarchism. That's with a C-H-I-S-M at the end. This is a noun from 1642. One, a political theory holding all forms of government authority to be unnecessary and undesirable and advocating a society based on voluntary cooperation and free association of individuals and groups. Two, the advocacy or practice of anarchistic principles. Next, we have anarchist. This is a noun from 1678. 1. A person who rebels against any authority, established order, or ruling power. 2. A person who believes in, advocates, or promotes anarchism or anarchy, especially one who uses violent means to overthrow the established order. Anarchist or anarchistic are also adjectives. Next, we have anarcho-syndicalism. That is a funky word. There is a hyphen, uh, so it's anarcho, C-H-O, hyphen, syndicalism, S-Y-N-D-I-C-A-L-I-S-M. This is a noun from circa 1928. We have the synonym syndicalism. So when we get to the S's, we'll see what that means. Uh, an anarcho-syndicalist is a noun or an adjective. Next, we have Anarchy, A-N-A-R-C-H-Y. I've never seen that show, Sons of Anarchy, but I've heard it's good, uh, so maybe someday I'll have to watch that. Uh, this is a noun from 1539. 1A, absence of government. 1B, a state of lawlessness or political disorder due to the absence of governmental authority. 1C, a utopian society of individuals who enjoy complete freedom without government. I don't know if this was ever mentioned in Parks and Rec, but I have a feeling uh, Ron Swanson would be an anarchist. He hates government. He just wants to do his own thing, basically. Uh, so maybe he would be considered an anarchist. 2A. Absence or denial of any authority or established order. 2B. 
absence of order. Synonym is disorder, which I guess would be the absence of order. Uh, as in, not manicured plots, but a wild anarchy of nature. And that is from Israel Schenker. Three, we just have the synonym anarchism. This says this is from the Middle Latin anarchia, which is from the Greek anarchos, uh, which means having no ruler. Uh, and that is from combining an plus arcos, and arcos means ruler. And there's more at the prefix arc, A-R-C-H. I think that's how it's pronounced in this situation. Now we have anasarca, A-N-A-S-A-R-C-A. This is a noun from the 14th century. Generalized edema with accumulation of serum in the connective tissue. Seems uh, medically related. Uh, Anasarcus, A-N-A-S-A-R-C-O-U-S, is an adjective. The etymology says this is from the Greek uh, prefix sark, S-A-R-K, or uh, the word sarx, S-A-R-X, which means flesh, like your skin. Uh, and there's more at the word sarcasm. So I am super curious to know how the word sarcasm was created uh, when its root word means flesh. Also, I just love sarcasm in general. I, I use it a lot, uh, but people don't often get my jokes. I think I say them too seriously, so they don't realize I'm being sarcastic and telling a joke. So people are very confused at, my, at the things I say. Next we have, I hope I pronounced this correctly, uh, Anasazi or Anasazi, uh, capital A-N-A-S-A-Z-I. This is a noun from 1938, a prehistoric American Indian inhabitant of the canyons of northern Arizona, 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 and New Mexico and southwestern Colorado. It says it's a Navajo word, Anasazi, A-N-A-A-S-A-Z-I, and it literally means enemy ancestors. Now we have anastigmat. I think that's the uh, correct emphasis on the syllables and pronunciation. A-N-A-S-T-I-G-M-A-T. This is a noun from 1890. All it says is an anastigmatic lens. And anastigmatic is our next word, because I do not know what an anastigmatic lens is. I knew anamorphic, but this one's new to me. This is an adjective from 1890, and it just says not astigmatic. And it's used especially of lenses that are able to form approximately point images of object points. And I don't know what that is, so this is definitely something that I'm going to have to look into, uh, and I'll probably put a link into the episode description. And I think we'll do one more for this episode. Anastomose. A-N-A-S-T-O-M-O-S-E. This is a verb from 1697. Transitive definition is to connect or join by anastomosis. I think that's a science word. The intransitive definition is to communicate or be joined by anastomosis. And now is the time that I pick a word for this episode, and I'm going to go with anastigmatic, because uh, it's a lens, and if you've heard previous episodes, you know that the world of, of film and photography is something that I'm pretty interested in, but I don't know what this is. Uh, so I'm going to have to look into that one, and, and I pick that one for the word of the episode. Rate, review, subscribe, say hi, and until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to yet another episode of The Dictionary. Every day, these are getting added to your feed. Thank you if you're listening to this. Thank you very much for downloading and listening. And if this is your first episode, go back to episode one. Listen to how this started in a very terrible way, but then, I hope, slowly got better and better. But it's still The Dictionary. I'm still reading The Dictionary, so that hasn't changed. But I do want you to go uh, on this journey with me in order. All right, first word is anastomosis. And it probably would have made sense for me to read this in the last episode because our last word was anastomose and they are related. But I decided, I guess, unconsciously to split them up and confuse you. This is a noun from 1541. 
One, the union of parts or branches, as of streams, blood vessels, or leaf veins, so as to intercommunicate or interconnect. Two, a product of anastomosis, and a synonym is the word network. Anastomotic is an adjective. The etymology says this is from the Greek anastemoun,、uh, m o u n, which means to provide with an outlet. And that is from stoma, which means mouth or opening. And there's more at the word stomach.、Uh, and I am aware that if somebody has a stoma, that's usually something、um, that's on their stomach area, their belly somewhere, then it's、uh, basically an opening that goes directly into their either stomach or intestines.、Uh, and they'll have that for a variety of different medical reasons. Uh, so that's where、uh, so we get the word stoma. It means mouth or opening. All right, moving on, we have anastrophe, A N A S T R O P H E. This is a noun from circa 1550, inversion of the usual syntactical order of words for rhetorical effect. Compare to histeron, proteron,、uh, H Y S T E R O N, second word, P R O T. T E R O N. I don't know what anything is that I just read, but this is from the Greek anastrophe, which literally means turning back.、Uh, and that is from anastrophein, which means to turn back. And that is from strafein, which means to turn. Now we have A N A T. This is an abbreviation for anatomical or anatomy. Now we have anatase. A N A T A S E. This is a noun from circa 1828, a tetragonal mineral consisting of titanium dioxide and used especially as a white pigment.、Uh, I hope I said tetragonal correctly. T e t r a g o n a l. I think in this case it just means a thing that has a bunch of faces on it.、Uh, I don't know if、um, it's a specific amount of faces like. Five or ten or one thousand two hundred and five, but yeah, that's what that is. So it's a it's a mineral in a tetragonal shape that has titanium dioxide. The etymology says this is from the Greek an anatasis, which means extension,、uh, and that is from anatainin, which means to extend,、uh, and that is from tainin, which means to stretch. And there's more at the word thin, t h i n. Next we have anathema, a n a t h e m a. This is a noun from 1526. One a, one that is cursed by ecclesiastical authority. One b, someone or something intensely disliked or loathed, usually used as a predicate nominative, as in this notion was anathema to most of his countrymen. That was from S. J. Gould. 2 a a ban or curse solemnly pronounced pronounced solemnly pronounced a ban or curse solemnly pronounced by ecclesiastical authority and accompanied by excommunication. 2 b the denunciation of something as accursed or accursed. 2 c a vigorous denunciation. Synonym is curse. Uh, this is from the Latin anathema, which is from Greek, probably the same word,、uh, which means thing devoted to evil or curse, and that is from anantithani, which means to set up or dedicate, and that is from tithani, which means to place or set, and there's more at the word do, d o. Next we have anathematize, a related word. We just added t i z e to the end. Uh, this is a transitive verb from 1566 to pronounce an anathema upon,、uh, and in this case, I'm guessing that is a a curse, basically to to pronounce a curse on. I have anathematized you. Next, we have Anatolian, capital A N A T O L I A N. This is a noun from 1590. One, a native or inhabitant of Anatolia. And specifically of the western plateau lands of Turkey in Asia. Two, a branch of the Indo-European language family 
that includes a group of extinct languages of ancient Anatolia. And it says, see uh, the Indo-European languages table. Anatolian is an adjective. I really don't know a lot about these Indo-European languages, so uh, when we get there, I'll be curious to see what that table says. I think I've heard of Anatolia and Anatolian, uh, but honestly, my ignorance uh, and memory are slipping through here, and I don't really know what it is. I know all the people who know me will be like, oh, come on, how, how could you not know what Anatolia is? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just not very well versed in that part of the world, and I should be, and that's why I'm reading the dictionary. But if you want to know what Anatolia is, go look it up, because that's what I'm going to do. Now we have Anatolian Shepherd. I'm going to guess that this is a shepherd in the Anatolian region uh, that deals with sheep, maybe. Uh, okay, this is a noun from 1970. Any of a breed of large, rugged, working dogs of Turkish origin. So it's not a person who's a shepherd, it's a dog that's a shepherd. And they probably shepherd around sheep and things. Next we have anatomize. A-N-A-T-O-M-I-S-E. This is the British variation of the American English anatomize with a Z instead of the S. Now we have anatomist. So we've added a T instead of an E to anatomize. This is a noun from 1543. One, a specialist in anatomy. Two, one who analyzes minutely and critically, as in an anatomist of urban society. And now we have that American English word anatomize. Uh, this is a verb, transitive verb, from the 15th century. One, to cut in pieces in order to display or examine the structure and use of the parts. Synonym is dissect. I took biology in, uh, I think I was a sophomore. Yeah, I think I was a sophomore in high school. And we had to dissect like a frog and a worm. Uh, but then we had to do a fetal pig. And we were in groups of maybe three for that one. And all three of us basically just refused to dissect the pig. We It was too... I don't want to say human-like, but it was more human-like than the frog was. There was quite a smell. There was an odor with it. None of us liked it. I think we ended up just like writing an essay uh, in replacement of that assignment. Um, but I'm glad that none of us wanted to do it because if it was just one of us who didn't want to do it and the other two were fine with it, then that would have been all unequal and not cool. But um, yeah, I, I wasn't cool with dissecting uh, a, a fetal pig. And then I knew people in other schools who had to dissect a cat. Oh, and that would have been even worse. I have two cats and I just, uh, too, that's too much for me. Back to the word anatomize. Uh, the number two definition just has the synonym analyze. All right, now we have anatomy. This is a noun from the 14th century. One, a branch of morphology that deals with the structure of organisms. Two, a treatise or treatise of anatomical science or art. Three, the art of separating the parts of an organism in order to ascertain their position, relations, structure, and function. Synonym is dissection. And obviously, to learn anatomy in the first place, many hundreds of years ago, people had to dissect things, uh, specifically humans. Uh, so number four is obsolete. A body dissected or to be dissected. I guess you, you would call that an anatomy. Five, structural makeup, especially of an organism or any of its parts. Six, a separating or dividing into parts for detailed examination. Analysis is a synonym. 7A1, synonym is skeleton. 7A2, synonym is mummy. 7B, the human body. That's all the definitions for that one. Anatomical or anatomic are adjectives, and anatomically is an adverb. Now we have anatropus. A-N-A-T-R-O-P-O-U-S. This is an adjective from circa 1846. Having or being a plant ovule inverted so that the micropile or micropill 
uh, is bent down to the funiculus to which the body of the ovule is united. I probably won't understand what I read until I'm listening back to this to edit. Uh, let's go through a few words here. Ovule, which was said twice, is spelled O-V-U-L-E. Uh, micropill or micropile is M-I-C-R-O-P-Y-L-E. And then funiculus is F-U-N-I-C-U-L-U-S. Uh, just in case I didn't say those words clearly or whatever. All right, next we have A-N-C. This is an abbreviation for the word ancient. And last word for this episode is A-N-C, all caps. It is an abbreviation for the African National Congress. And oh, what word shall I pick for the word of the episode? Uh, I guess maybe the most interesting word to me was ananthema. Uh, that one has a bunch of different definitions, uh, specifically one that basically just says uh, it's a curse. Uh, I think that's kind of interesting, and it's a fun word. Uh, it's different. It's new to me. I hadn't heard it before, uh, and maybe it was uh, new to you as well. So there you have it. That is the end of the episode. The next episode will start with the top of page 46. That's all I got. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Are you ready for more words? I know I am. Let's do it. All right. Uh, first, for this episode is a suffix. A-N-C-E. Ants? That's probably how it's pronounced. Let's find out. Uh, this is a noun suffix from a year that it does not tell me. I should probably be used to that with prefixes and suffixes. All right, number one, action or process, as in furtherance. And then it also says instance of an action or process, as in performance. Two, quality or state, instance of a quality or state, as in protuberance. Three, amount or degree, as in conductance. Next we have ancestor. This is a noun from the 13th century, 1a, one from whom a person is descended and who is usually more remote in the line of descent than a grandparent. 1b, we have the synonym forefather. 2, we have the synonyms forerunner and prototype. 3, a progenitor of a more recent or existing species or group. This is from the Latin uh, antecessor, I think that's how it's pronounced, which means predecessor, and that is from antecadere, which means to go before, and that is made combining ante and cadere, which means to go. Next we have ancestor worship. This is a noun from 1854, the custom of venerating deceased ancestors who are considered still a part of the family and whose spirits are believed to have the power to intervene in the affairs of the living. Next we have ancestral. This is an adjective from the 15th century of relating to or inherited from an ancestor, as in ancestral estates. Ancestrally is an adverb. Now we have ancestress. This is a noun from 1580 a female ancestor. Very short definition. Now we have ancestry. This is a noun from the 14th century. One, line of descent. Lineage is a synonym, especially honorable, noble, or aristocratic descent. Two, persons initiating or comprising a line of descent. And ancestors is a synonym. Next we have anchises. I think that's how it's pronounced. I wanted to say Anchises, but the pronunciation guide uh, is telling me it's Anchises. Capital A-N-C-H-I-S-E-S. -E this is a noun from the 14th century. The father of Aenas, A-E-N-E-A-S, rescued by his son from the burning city of Troy. Next we have Ancho, A-N-C-H-O. This is a noun from 1902. A poblano chili pepper, especially when mature and dried to a reddish black, compared to the word poblano. This is American Spanish, ancho, 
Uh, and before the word ancho, in parentheses, it says uh, chile or chile, C-H-I-L-E. Uh, and it literally means wide chili. Next, we have the word anchor, A-N-C-H-O-R. Uh, and I think this will be the last word for this episode. It's also the first form of anchor. This is a noun from before the 12th century. One, a device usually of metal attached to a ship or boat by a cable and cast overboard to hold it in a particular place by means of a fluke that digs into the bottom. Two, a reliable or principal support. Synonym is mainstay. Three, something that serves to hold an object firmly. Four, an object shaped like a ship's anchor. Five, an anchorman or anchorwoman. Six, the member of a team, as a relay team, that competes last. Seven, a large business, as a department store, that attracts customers and other businesses to a shopping center or mall. Four, a fixed object as a tree or a piton, python, to which a climber's rope is secured. And I'm not a climber, so I don't know if it's piton or python or piton. It's P-I-T-O-N. Uh, anchorless is an adjective, and the phrase at anchor means being anchored. It looks like this is from the Old English anga, A-N-G-A, which means hook, and there's more at the word angle, and I've, uh, I've skipped most of the etymology, by the way. Uh, and there is a picture of five anchors, A, B, C, D, and E. So the A anchor is called a yachtsman's. Uh, it's kind of just the typical anchor that you see, uh, a vertical bar, a horizontal bar near the top, and then the curved piece at the bottom uh, with the sort of uh, flared pointy pieces. Uh, there are numbers for the A anchor, the yachtsman's anchor. Uh, one is the ring, so there's a ring at the very top of the vertical bar. Uh, number two is the stock, so that is basically the horizontal piece near the top. Uh, three is the shank, and that's the vertical bar. Uh, four is the bill, and it looks like it's the very point of uh, one of the points on the curved piece at the bottom. Uh, five is the fluke, which is the, uh, the sort of flared out part right before the point. Number six is the arm, and that is the curved piece, um, but it's the part that's on either side of the vertical bar. Uh, seven is the throat, which looks like it's where the vertical bar and the curved piece meet. Uh, and then number eight is the crown, which is the very uh, bottom point of the curved piece. Uh, the B uh, anchor is called a fluke. This one has a lot of pointy, uh, pointy edges. Uh, there's the vertical bar, and then at the bottom, there's a horizontal bar with two uh, very pointy pieces sticking straight up from that. You've probably seen a picture of it. The C anchor is called a grapnel, G-R-A-P-N-E-L. Uh, so this one is similar to the very first one, but there's no horizontal bar at the top, and instead of having two curved pieces at the bottom, there's four, so they go off in four different directions. Uh, the D anchor is called a plow, and it looks like a plow, so there's a, uh, so there is the vertical bar, but in the position, uh, in the angle that they have it in, it's more of maybe a 10 to 20 degrees from zero. Uh, that doesn't really help if you don't understand what that means. It's not totally vertical, it's just sort of going off to the side. And then um, underneath that is a, uh, a thing that looks like a plow. So go look up a plow, or just go look up a plow anchor, and you can see what it looks like. And then finally we have the E anchor, it's called a mushroom, uh, and it pretty much just looks like an upside down mushroom. So we have the vertical piece, but then at the bottom, it looks like it's a bowl, pretty much. So that will end this episode. Thank you for listening. I'm going to go ahead and record a few more. And uh, next will be the second form of the word anchor. And when I recorded this episode, I uh, totally forgot to mention this, but today, August 3rd, is my grandfather's 94th birthday. So happy birthday to you, Russ. I'm sure I will be celebrating with you uh, around the time of today. That was a weird sentence. 
Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary. Last night was June, no, July. Jeez, I'm off a month. Uh, July 28th, and I went with a few people uh, and saw Weird Al play. Uh, he is on his Strings Attached tour, uh, which is where he's got a, a full orchestra behind him playing him playing his songs with him. Uh, and so it was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Looking forward to his next tour. I hope to go. All right, let's get to the words. First, we have anchor, A-N-C-H-O-R. This is the second form. If you listen to the last episode, we had the first form. This is a verb from the 13th century. Transitive definitions are, one, to hold in place in the water by an anchor, as in anchor a ship. Two, to secure firmly. Fix is a synonym, as in anchor a post in concrete. And uh, by the way, if you didn't remember, the previous form of anchor was a noun, and we are uh, looking at the verb form. Okay, number three to act or serve as an anchor for, as in, it is she who is anchoring the rebuilding campaign. And that is from G.D. Boone, B-O-O-N-E. Um, also, as in, anchoring the evening news. Now we have the intransitive definitions. One, to cast anchor. And two, to become fixed. All right, next we have the word anchorage. This is a noun from the 15th century. 1A, a place where vessels anchor, a place suitable for anchoring. 1B, the act of anchoring, the condition of being anchored. 2, a means of securing, a source of reassurance, as in this anchorage of Christian hope. And that is from T.O. Weddell, W-E-D-E-L. Three, something that provides a secure hold. Now we have anchoress, A-N-C-H-O-R-E-S-S, or A-N-C-R-E-S-S. This is a noun from the 14th century. One, a woman who is an anchorite. I don't know what an anchorite is, but I think we are going to find that out shortly. But if we look at the uh, etymology... This is from uh, Middle English anchoress, spelled A-N-K-E-R-E-S-S-E, -E, uh, which is from the word anchor, A-N-K-E-R, which means hermit, like someone who stays in their house. So uh, maybe that gives us a clue as to what anchorite means, which is our next word. It is spelled A-N-C-H-O-R-I-T-E or A-N-C-H-O-R-E-T. This is a noun from the 15th century, a person who lives in seclusion, usually for religious reasons. And as I've mentioned before, I'm not uh, religious, uh, so that's probably why I didn't know what this word was. Anchoritic is an adjective, and anchoritically is an adverb. The etymology says this is from the Greek anachorin, which means to withdraw, and that is from korin, which means uh, to make room. And that is from koros, or choros, which means a uh, place, P-L-A-C-E. Now we have anchorman, all one word. This is a noun from 1911. One, a person who is last as, 1A, the member of a team who competes last, as in, the anchorman on a relay team. I wonder if it would be anchorman. It might be pronounced anchorman in that situation. Uh, 1B, the student who has the lowest scholastic standing in a graduating class. 2, a broadcaster, as on a news program, who introduces reports by other broadcasters and usually reads the news. And that, of course, reminds me of the movie Anchorman, uh, which if you are a young person listening to this podcast, uh, you should probably not see that movie until you are old enough. And then the third definition, we just have the word moderator to see. Next is anchor people, all one word. It's a noun from 1974, and it has the synonym anchor persons. And anchor person is next. It's a noun from 1973, an anchor man or anchor woman. Now we have anchor woman. It's a noun from 1973, 
a woman who anchors a broadcast. Next we have, I think it's pronounced Anchoveta, A-N-C-H-O-V-E-T-A. Uh, it could also be spelled with a double T. This is a noun from 1940, a small anchovy of the Pacific coast of America from Southern California to Peru. Anchoveta. Okay, that sounded Italian. It's not Italian. It's Spanish. Anchoveta. No, that still sounded Italian. I just won't say it again. Uh, but it is uh, the diminutive of the word anchova. And we say anchovy, I guess. Next is anchovy. Or anchovy. No. God, why am I having trouble uh, with the syllables emphasis? Anchovy. No. Anchovy. What? How do you say this word? I would like anchovies. Anchovies. Oh boy, this word sounds so weird to me now. You know what I'm talking about. I'm going to move forward. This is a noun from 1595. Any of a family of small fishes resembling herrings that includes several that are important food fishes used especially in appetizers as a garnish and for making sauces and relishes. Uh, I have some scientific names to read to you. In the previous word, anchoveta, um, the small anchovy is setengraulis mysticitis or mysticitis. Not sure if the C is a K or a S sound. Um, and in the word anchovy, did I say it right that time? I think I did. Uh, the family name is uh, engraulidae, and the uh, uh, small fishes resembling herrings, uh, the scientific name is engraulis encrasicholis or engrasicholis, something like that. Whoo, my mouth is uh, hopefully warmed up now. Next we have, I hope I pronounced this correctly, ancien regime. First word, A-N-C-I-E-N. -E Second is R-E-G-I-M-E. -E. And the uh, first E in regime has an accent. Uh, this is a noun from 1794. One, the political and social system of France before the revolution of 1789. Two, a system or mode no longer prevailing. And this is uh, French. It literally means old regime. Ancien Régime. Next, we have the word ancient. It will be our last for this episode. Uh, but let's see. It's the first form of three, and we are going to read the first two forms in this episode. So here we go with the first form of ancient. This is an adjective from the 14th century. One, having had an existence of many years. Two, of or relating to a remote period to a time early in history or to those living in such a period or time, especially of or relating to the historical period beginning with the earliest known civilizations and extending to the fall of the Western Roman Empire in A.D. 476. 3. Having the qualities of age or long existence, as 3a, the synonym venerable, 3b, Synonyms are old-fashioned and antique. And we have a synonym for the whole uh, word in all of its definitions. It's the word old, O-L-D. Uh, ancient-ness is a noun. Now we have the second form of ancient. This is a noun from 1502. One, an aged or aged living being, as in a penniless ancient. Two, a person who lived in ancient times. 2a, plural, the civilized people of antiquity, especially those of the classical nations. 2b, one of the classical authors, as in Plutarch or Plutarch and other ancients. 3, an ancient coin. And that is the end of this episode. As usual, rate and review and share and subscribe and say hi to my email address or whatever. So, until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, nerds of words. This is me talking to you.
Let's get to it. First for this episode is the word ancient, A-N-C-I-E-N-T. We read the first two forms in the previous episode, and we're going to read the third form in this episode. This is a uh, noun from 1554. One is archaic. We have the synonyms ensign, that's uh, E-N-S-I-G-N, and standard, and flag. So three synonyms, ensign, standard, and flag. Two is obsolete, the bearer of an ensign. Now, is it ensign in this case? So it does look like uh, the word ensign can also be pronounced ensign, uh, which I had never heard before. So in this case, maybe that's what it means, um, or that's how it's pronounced. Uh, And the etymology does say this is an alternative of the word ensign or ensign. If you know the answer to that, go ahead and uh, email me, dictionarypod at email.com or Twitter or Facebook. All the contact info is in the description of the episode. Okay, next we have ancient history. This is a noun from 1555. One, the history of ancient times. Two, knowledge or information that is widespread and has lost its initial freshness or importance. And then it says common knowledge. Next we have anciently. This is an adverb from the 15th century. It means in ancient times or long ago. Next we have ancient tree. A-N-C-I-E-N-T-R-Y. This is a noun from 1580. We have the synonyms antiquity and ancientness. Next we have ancilla. A-N-C-I-L-L-A. This is a noun from 1902, an aid to achieving or mastering something difficult. The etymology says this is a Latin word, and it means female servant. So, does that mean that originally a female servant was called an ancilla, and they helped you achieve something difficult? Uh, What would that something be? I don't know. But now I assume that it's not uh, related to female servants. And now we have the word ancillary. So uh, this should be related to ancilla. It's spelled A-N-C-I-L-L-A-R-Y. This is an adjective from 1667. One, we have these synonyms subordinate and subsidiary, as in the main factory and its ancillary plants. Two, synonyms are auxiliary and supplementary, as in the need for ancillary evidence. And ancillary is also a noun. Next, we have a suffix, A-N-C-Y. It means quality or state, as in piquancy. Why did they have to give me a word that I don't know how to pronounce? Piquancy? Piquancy? P-I-Q-U-A-N-C-Y. Thanks, dictionary. Next we have, I think it's pronounced ankylostomiasis. Sure, why not? A-N-C-Y-L-O-S-T-O-M-I-A-S-I-S. This is a noun from 1887. It just says hookworm too. So the second definition of the word hookworm, and the etymology says this is from the New Latin uh, ankylostoma, which means genus of hookworms. That is from the Greek ankylos, which means hooked. It's akin to the Old English anga, A-N-G-A, which means hook, plus the word stoma, which means mouth. And there's more at the words angle and stomach. And next we have the word and, A-N-D, probably one of the most uh, common words in the English language. This is a conjunction from the 12th century. One, used as a function word to indicate connection or addition, especially of items within the same class or type, used to join sentence elements of the same grammatical rank or function. To A, used as a function word to express logical modification, consequence, antithesis, or supplementary explanation. To B, used as a function word to join one finite verb, as go, come or try to another so that together they are logically equivalent to an infinitive of purpose as in come and see me 
Three is obsolete. It has the synonym if, if. Four, used in logic to form a conjunction. We have a phrase, and so forth. And we have uh, four definitions for the phrase. One, and others or more of the same or similar kind. Two, further in the same or similar manner. Three, and the rest. Four, and other things. And we have one more phrase, which is and so on, and it means and so forth. Not entirely different, but obviously different enough to give a definition for it. Next is uh, and again, but it is all caps. This is a noun from 1949, a logical operator that requires both of two inputs to be present or two conditions to be met for an output to be made or a statement to be executed. Next we have Andalusian, capital A-N-D-A-L-U-S-I-A-N. This is a noun from 1966. Any of a breed of horses of Spanish origin that have a high stepping gait. And of course, gait here is G-A-I-T. And this word is from Spain. Next is Andalusite. A-N-D-A-L-U-S-I-T-E. This is a noun from circa 1828. A mineral consisting of a silicate of aluminum, usually in thick orthorhombic prisms of various colors. Orthorhombic is spelled O-R-T-H-O-R-H-O-M-B-I-C. Next we have Andante. Uh, we have two forms, and they both will be the last for this episode. A-N-D-A-N-T-E. It could also be pronounced andanti. This is an adverb or an adjective from 1724. Moderately slow, usually used as a direction in music. This is Italian. It literally means going, uh, and it's from andare, which means to go. Second form of andante is a noun from 1784, a musical composition or movement in andante tempo. There you have it. I just remembered that I forgot to pick a word for the last two episodes. Uh, so whatever, I'm just going to deal with it. Uh, but I should pick one for this episode. So let's see what that should be. I think I'm just going to pick the word and because it's an incredibly important word in the English language. It's very simple and short, uh, but we would be lost without it. That will end this episode. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to what is it? Say it with me. The dictionary. I'm your host, Spencer. Let's get to the words. First is... Andantino, A-N-D-A-N-T-I-N-O, and this has two forms. First form is an adverb or an adjective from 1819. Slightly faster than andante, which was the last word in the previous episode. It's used as a direction in music. And it says this is Italian and it's a diminutive of andante. Second form of andantino is a noun from 1845, a musical composition or movement in andantino tempo. Next we have Andean condor, two words. This is a noun from 1980, we just have the 1A definition for the word condor. Next is andesite, A-N-D-E-S-I-T-E. This is a noun from 1850. An extrusive, usually dark grayish rock consisting essentially of oligoclase or feldspar. Oligoclase might be pronounced incorrectly, but it is spelled O-L-I-G-O-C-L-A-S-E. And feldspar is F-E-L-D-S-P-A-R. Andesitic is an adjective. Next we have and how. Two separate words. This is an adverb from 1865, used to emphasize the preceding idea, as in having a great time and how. Next we have and iron. This is one word, but it looks like it's two words and and iron. This is a noun from the 14th century. 
either of a pair of metal supports for firewood used on a hearth and made of a horizontal bar mounted on short legs with usually a vertical shaft surmounting the front end. Next we have and or. Uh, I haven't seen uh, something like this in the dictionary yet. It is A-N-D slash O-R. Uh, I use this pretty often when I'm typing messages or uh, emails or whatever. Uh, I didn't really expect to see it like this in the dictionary, but there you have it. Uh, this is a conjunction from 1853, used as a function word to indicate that two words or expressions are to be taken together or individually, as in language comprehension and or production, and that is from David Crystal. Next we have andouille, A-N-D-O-U-I-L-L-E. This is a noun from 1605, a highly spiced smoked pork sausage. Lots of adjectives in that description. This is from uh, Old French, andouille, uh, spelled a little bit different. It is from some form of Latin. I don't know what form it is. It says V-L. Is it very Latin? No, probably not. Uh, which is inductilia, uh, that is the neutral plural of inductilis, uh, which is made by insertion, and that is from the Latin inductus, uh, which is from the verb inducere, uh, which means to insert or bring in, and there's more at the word induce. Next we have andouillet, a-n-d-o-u-i-l-l-e-t-t-e. This is a noun from 1611, a fresh pork sausage made with tripe or chitterlings. This is French, and it is a diminutive of the word andouille that we just read. Next, we have a prefix, A-N-D-R or A-N-D-R-O. One, male human being, as in androcentric. Two, male, as in androecium. I don't know what those examples mean. The etymology is saying this is from the Greek A-N-D-R or A-N-E-R, and it's akin to uh, the Oscan N-E-R, that's a prefix, N-E-R, uh, which means man, that is from uh, Sanskrit, N-A-R, also from, I think it's saying Old Irish, nert, N-E-R-T, which means strength. Next is andradite, A-N-D-R-A-D-I-T-E. This is a noun from 1868. A calcium iron garnet occurring in various colors ranging from yellow and green to brown and black. This is from Jose B. de Andrada y Silva. And I think he died in 1838, and he was a Brazilian geologist. Next, we have andro, A-N-D-R-O. This is a noun from 1997. We just have the synonym, oh boy, let's see if I can say this word, androstenedione. No, that's probably not right. Androstenediani. I'm just going to spell it for you and you can figure out how to pronounce it. A-N-D-R-O-S-T-E-N-E-D-I-O-N-E. Next is androcentric. This is an adjective from 1903. Dominated by or emphasizing masculine interests or a masculine point of view. Androcentrism is a noun. Next we have androcles, capital A-N-D-R-O-C-L-E-S. This is a noun from 1607. A fabled Roman slave spared in the arena by a lion for whose foot he had years before extracted a thorn. Next we have andricium. Of course, I had to look at the pronunciation to figure out how it was pronounced. A-N-D-R-O-E-C-I-U-M. This is a noun from circa 1839. The aggregate of stamens in the flower of a seed plant. This is uh, New Latin from the prefix A-N-D-R plus the Greek uh, oikion, which is a diminutive of oikos, O-I-K-O-S. Of course, I don't know how to pronounce Greek words. Uh, and oikos means house, and there's more at the word vicinity. Next, we have androgen, A-N-D-R-O-G-E-N. This is a noun from 1936. A male sex hormone, 
as testosterone. Androgenic is an adjective. Next is androgenesis. This is a noun from circa 1900. Development of an embryo containing only paternal chromosomes due to failure of the egg to participate in fertilization. Androgenetic is an adjective. Next we have androgen, A-N-D-R-O-G-Y-N-E. This is a noun from the 12th century, very old. One that is androgynous. And I had to retake that because the, my stupid brain kept on hearing andro, andro, and so I said androgynous. Uh, it's our next word, and that's when I figured out it was androgynous. All right, so it is an adjective from 1651. One, having the characteristics or nature of both male and female. 2A, neither specifically feminine nor masculine, as in the androgynous pronoun them. And these days, I've been seeing a lot of people in their uh, Twitter bios or Instagram bios, or at work we have that program Slack, so you can message people um, and their bios in there. Uh, it, they, people will put in their preferred pronouns. He, she, uh, his, her, them, etc. Um, and I think that's good to see because you don't know how people identify. Uh, you could look at somebody, you can hear their name, and you might assume how they identify, but you really have no idea. So um, it's great that people are actually letting you know so you don't have to take a guess. But if you do take a guess and you are mistaken, I do hope that they uh, respect that and understand where you're coming from. And that's why it's very helpful that they're uh, giving you that on the front end. All right, to be suitable to or for either sex as in androgynous clothing. Three, having traditional male and female roles obscured or reversed, as in an androgynous marriage. Androgynously is an adverb, and androgyny is a noun. Next is android. This is a noun from uh, circa 1751, a mobile robot usually with a human form. And I think it's fascinating that it's as old as 1751. Uh, this is from uh, the Latin Greek androides. I screwed that one up badly, I'm sure. Uh, that means man-like. All right, next and last word is andrology. A-N-D-R-O-L-O-G-Y. This is a noun from circa 1899. A branch of medicine concerned with male diseases and especially with those affecting the male reproductive system. Uh, we read a lot of words that um, seem to be specifically male-oriented. I'm uh, hoping and expecting that later in the dictionary we will come across words uh, that would be the female gender version of these. Uh, I don't know if they'll all be in a row like these ones are, uh, but we'll see. So, uh, fingers crossed that eventually we'll get to those. And now is the time that I pick the word of the episode. What shall I pick? I think just because it's pretty important in the time that we're living in right now, I'm just going to pick androgynous. Uh, clearly, gender issues are a big, big thing going on right now. People are becoming very comfortable in their own skin, way more than they ever used to be. It's a very important time that we're living in, uh, specifically with gender equality. So, um, androgynous, I think in this case, um, is just a word that is sort of encompassing all of that. So that's the word. That is the end of the episode. Thank you for listening and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to a new episode of the dictionary. Yes, these are coming to you every single day. We are at the top of page 47. Astounding. First word for this episode is andromache. I think that is how it's pronounced, capital A-N-D-R-O-M-A-C-H-E. This is a noun from the 14th century, the wife of Hector. Who's Hector? Do you know a Hector? I don't know a Hector. Maybe I should look that up. Next we have Andromeda. This is a noun from 1754, any of several evergreen shrubs of the Heath family, especially Japanese Andromeda. And the scientific name, uh, or actually the genera or genera for uh, evergreen shrubs are Pieris and Andromeda. 
Next, we have Andromeda again, but this time it has a capital A. This is a noun from 1551. One, an Ethiopian princess of Greek mythology rescued from a monster by her future husband, Perseus. Two, a northern constellation directly south of Cassiopeia between Pegasus and Perseus. And there is a movie called The Andromeda Strain. Uh, maybe it's from the 60s, 70s, something like that. I don't think I've ever seen it, but uh, if I remember correctly, I think it's about uh, some sort of virus or something that comes from that um, Andromeda constellation galaxy area. That sounded very intelligent when I said it just now, didn't it? That was a joke. Next, we have Andropause. A-N-D-R-O-P-A-U-S-E. This is a noun from 1967. A gradual and highly variable decline in the production of androgenic hormones and especially testosterone in the human male together with its associated effects that is held to occur during and after middle age. Called also climacteric male menopause. Next we have is a word that I had a horrible time pronouncing in the previous episode, and I'm afraid I'm going to have a hard time again. Um, but looking at the pronunciation guide, I think it is androstenedione. A-N-D-R-O-S-T-E-N-E-D-I-O-N-E. And it looks like it can also be pronounced androstenedione. So slightly different uh, emphasis. This is a noun from 1935. A steroid sex hormone, C19H2602, that is secreted by the testes, ovaries, and adrenal cortex, and is an intermediate in the biosynthesis of testosterone and estrogen. Next we have androsterone. A-N-D-R-O-S-T-E-R-O-N-E. This is a noun from 1934 an androgenic hormone that is a hydroxyketone, C19H30O2, found especially in male urine. Next we have ane, A-N-E. This is an adjective or a noun or pronoun, I think it's what it's saying. Uh, it's from before the 12th century. It's chiefly Scottish and it just means one. And uh, no wonder it did not look familiar to me. Now we have the suffix A-N-E. One, we have the uh, first definition of the prefix A-N, uh, which we read a little while back. It's the third form of the suffix A-N, actually. Uh, as in, furane. Two, saturated hydrocarbon, as in alkane and methane, or as some people say, methane. Next, we have a word that I will probably mess up again. It is anecdotage. That might be right. A-N-E-C-D-O-T-A-G-E. -E. This is a noun from 1798. One, garrulous old age or garrulous old age. Uh, that word that I'm having trouble with is G-A-R-R-U-L-O-U-S. Two, the feeling of anecdotes. Also, the synonym anecdotes. Next, we have anecdotal, A-N-E-C-D-O-T-A-L. This is an adjective from 1747, 1A, of relating to or consisting of anecdotes, as in an anecdotal biography. 1B, the two definition of the word anecdotic, which we will probably get to soon, as in my anecdotal uncle. 2 based on or consisting of reports or observations of usually unscientific observers, as in anecdotal evidence. Three, of relating to or being the depiction of a scene suggesting a story, as in anecdotal details. And anecdotally is an adverb. Next is anecdotalist or anecdotist. This is a noun from 1837 a person who is given to or is skilled in telling anecdotes. Anecdotalism is a noun. And now we have the word anecdote, which I think will be the uh, last word for this episode. 
uh, and also the base word for the last few definitions. Uh, this is a noun from, where is it, circa 1721. The plural is anecdotes, um, or also anecdota, which I was not aware of. A usually short narrative of an interesting, amusing, or biographical incident. I would argue that it doesn't really have to be interesting uh, or amusing. It's just a story. Uh, and I say that because most of my stories or anecdotes are not very interesting or amusing. In fact, in high school, my friends would make fun of me for telling the worst stories. Uh, and somebody said, hey, at the end of your story, you could just say, and then I found $5, which would make it uh, have a great ending. Uh, so I started to do that just to be silly. And uh, depending on how bad the story was, uh, I would say a different amount of money. So sometimes it would be a, a $2 story, but sometimes it would be a $10 story if it was uh, particularly bad. Uh, and I've actually fooled a few people over the years. Not that I was trying to fool them, uh, but there were a few people who actually thought that I found money when I was done with my story. They're so stupid. Let's get to the etymology for this word. Uh, it is from the Greek anecdota, which means unpublished items, which is uh, from the neutral of anecdotos. That's a plural, anecdotos, which means unpublished. And that is from ekdidonai, which means to publish. And that is from ex, which means out, plus didonai, which means to give. And there's more at the prefix ex and the word date. D-A-T-E. So I think that will end this episode, as I said. And what is our word? I know I'm just going to pick anecdote uh, because it was the base word for a few of these words, and it's just a good word. Uh, it means story. I, I like to tell stories, I guess, sometimes, which you hear me do on this podcast. All right, that's enough for this episode. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>